Good evening, everybody. Glad to see you all here tonight. And um, I'm very proud to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening, uh, Chris Sargent. Um, he's a GIS uh, web developer for the city of Decatur and does some really cool stuff uh, with maps, um, which is uh, sort of the, the subject of his topic tonight, uh, mapping, mapping applications with HTML5 and JavaScript. And uh, Chris, Chris has an interesting history. Um, he's originally from Springfield, so how he ended up in Decatur, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> He uh, uh, graduated from Lanfair High School in 1987 um, and then was in the Marines for six years. So he's a pretty tough guy. Um, he served in uh, Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield, uh, loading anti-tank missiles. So I'll remember not to make you mad. Um, he has a degree in psychology uh, from the University of Illinois at Springfield. And uh, he actually got started in development because um, he was a caseworker for the state and really got into number crunching and, and statistics. And from statistics, he got into to maps. And from maps, he got into doing GIS. And, uh, and I also wanted to mention that you got into uh, maps using VBA and Microsoft Access. So um, I think he should be considered a veteran for that, too. Um, but he has uh, been a GIS web developer for the city of Decatur for seven years now, his longest gig. And he's here tonight to share that experience with us. So um, if you'll please join me in a round of applause to welcome Chris Sargent. Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? Hey, anybody already familiar with geographic information systems? <laughs> geographic information systems? Well, basically maps. You might have been on a MapQuest, Google Earth, stuff like that, looked up directions. I'm kind of going from the back end where I program that kind of interface. Now, I used to be at the state of Illinois and we created maps, our original maps. It was kind of scary. The program interface was Windows Paint, which basically clicked on a map and colored every county in the state of Illinois, worked with on the welfare system. And then I eventually ended up at the city of Decatur and they uh, talk them into saying, hey, give me a chance as a regular programmer and kind of learning my way in GIS web applications. But as I started learning more and more about web applications, another thing I want to cover tonight besides just GIS is good web development. There's a lot of folks out there that, and I hope you're not one of them, but sometimes I go online and I look at examples and I have a hard time following it. I buy technology books. I have a hard time following them because you can find 1,000 things that don't work for the one thing that does work when you go online. And even in then some books, you can't get support when even if you write to them and your email and everything, it just doesn't work out. This, I just couldn't get rid of them a shark. <laughs> one of the things as a programmer is like a shark in the water. To, to survive as a shark, they can't stop swimming for all their lives. As a programmer, you need to stop and think about what you're doing before you move on when you're programming. And just going to kind of get into this is going to be a little bit of everything. I'm going to cover all this. GIS, your graphic information system, HTML5, kind of the flavor of the day right now, which is web developers here. Oh, good. I kind of got into XHTML strict, so HTML5 is kind of difficult for me because it seems like it's, you can just do anything with it because it's, it's too user friendly. And when you get used to strict programming, just say it's got to be done this way, and then, or else you get these errors. Technically, if you just run the application, even though you get the errors, it's still going to run. So. With all these options in HTML5, I have to kind of forget about the strict. Then I work with cascading style sheets, JavaScript. I put all the stuff in .NET, and then I use probably the coolest thing that the JavaScript, which is just JavaScript, is JavaScript frameworks, which you know, Dojo, Scriptaculous, jQuery, uh, Moo Tools, uh, UI, all kinds of fun stuff that I kind of tinkered with in all of them. Now, here, here is where I go online. This is where I started out with my web apps. Before you can build a geographic information systems web application, you have to build a foundational web app first. 
That's not me. But that's what I feel like sometimes when I'm going online looking for examples. Sometimes I'm going for examples for uh, JavaScript, cascading style sheets, and then you run your application in a browser, and the example that you see just doesn't work. And if you don't document your examples online or your code or the book's poorly written, then I have to know what you were thinking. It's the only way I will be able to do exactly what I've seen. You know, pictures, you'll see pictures of code working, but you won't actually see the code working. Now, here's where I begin. I begin with HTML or HTML5. Content is king. This is my foundation for all my applications in GIS. If, if nothing else, who cares about the presentation, the functionality, or the map if you don't have your content? So first, you want your content to load up or you're going to have empty seats on your website. Now, one of the I'm going to have to escape out of this in a second here, but mods, this is my own little acronym I created. You know, I think this might be because I'm with government and I've been federal, city, and state government over the years. So I made up my own acronym because I don't think you can operate without having an acronym in government. So this is MODS. What MODS is is my own darn documentation structure. And I'm going to kind of go into the application I created. Oh, and all software uh, tools that I'll show you tonight, everything's free. I mean, even though this is a Visual Studio 2010 Premium, you can do with Visual Web Developer Express, but I'm going to show you some other free tools as we go along here. I'm going to open my default.aspx page. Okay, here's where we have content is king. Right here at the very top, you have doc type HTML here. This tells you right away this is HTML5. If you start having all the things that says transitional or strict DTDs that you can't remember, you, you're getting into the old HTML4 formats. Uh, we go down to the HTML language. And here's where we have our content down here. Right here, see all these div IDs? There's one problem with div IDs for me. A div ID is nice when it starts. But have you ever programmed and you have your div ID and then you wipe something out accidentally and then part of your tree is gone and then you got the trailing div ID, the div and you don't know what divs are missing? I, I warned my wife about that when she was programming. I said, you ought to try this because and, and eventually she actually knocked out her uh, trailing div as well. What happens is, see we have a sidebar top fill, sidebar title begin. I name all my divs and then I put a, this is where my own darn documentation structure, so I can figure out where everything begins and where everything ends. Have my sidebar title right there. If something gets deleted, I can look at the trailing div because it goes just below the div. See right here is sidebar bottom end, same deal there. So if you wipe something out, it's easy to find what you've deleted. Okay. A few other things I do, I put all my style sheets at the top. I evaluate if it's Internet Explorer 9. This is just kind of a reference to, so yeah, since I'm using HTML5, so it'll uh, fail cleanly. And then a new thing, 
which I don't always see a lot of web developers do still, but on your HTML, if you're doing a .NET right at the very end before the body, this is where you should put all the references to your external JavaScript if you want your page to run faster. Basically what happens is your HTML gets loaded first and then your JavaScript runs. Otherwise you have to wait for the JavaScript to run before the page is completely loaded. Okay. If style versus style I have a coworker in my, my office that he's kind of doing it the old way still. There's three ways you can style an application. It's called embedded styles, inline styles, and external style sheets. What's kind of nice about, in, in, if originally you'd kind of say like you'd have your font and you change it to blue or black or orange, and then you could put it for each paragraph or each line. That's an inline style. Then, to make it even easier, you can do embedded styles, put it at the top of your web page, and then you could change these colors. But what's ideal is for your entire website is put this style sheet in external style sheet page. As you see, we have all our style sheets referenced outside of our uh, main map location. So now I can use this throughout the entire website instead of just this one page and then I can change my styles. You can change your styles outside. I actually minified my CSS styles, which is good form, but <laughs> I wanted to show you what the style sheets look like that was, that was layered. This is uh, one of the things you do to, once you have your cascading style sheets and your external styles, what you do is you need to minify them. You can reduce the uh, style sheets by 40% so when you minify a regular style sheet. If you don't minify your style sheets, you don't put your JavaScript at the end of the page, you will notice that your website's going kind of slower than it could have been. Now, these are some of the favorite JavaScript frameworks. Use Dojo. Dojo is the main API used for that a company called Esri, ESRI.com. If you want to tinker with it, what I'm going to show you today, you can tool around with this mapping application that I'm going to show you. They use the Dojo API for their application interface. It's one of them. They also use Flex and Silverlight. I use, uh, I use Prototype, Scriptaculous for uh, some of the interface. UE I've used, jQuery I've used some as well. MooTools, not so much. Sencha, since it became kind of more pri proprietary, they kind of have it split out, which it used to be, uh, what Sencha used to be? EXTJS e is what Sencha used to be. And then I use Rico for rounding corners on my application. And then if there's any of these uh, JavaScript frameworks you want to check out, I also put a QR, QR code there. You can try them out. And I also have them on a piece of paper here that you can scan them in. Okay, this mapping application and we were just talking about privacy before this. Uh, I can get in front of here. I don't want to get in front of it. Uh, we were talking about privacy with Facebook and all kinds of different things. But this, this real world application I'm going to show you actually is, and, and you're welcome to steal it. I have it on GitHub. It's a sex offender application. It's for registered sex offenders to come into our police department in the city of Decatur, and they ask if they can live at a certain location. And we, t we basically evaluate the address they ask us about. 
and tell them whether they can or not. The uh, information you're going to see is public information. There's one fake layer on here because it's private daycares and we can show you the public information but the non-public information we need to keep hidden. But we're going to kind of do a twist on it if everything works out well. And there's supposed to be a connect demo in a couple months here. So I figure some cities is going to do everything wireless. I mean, uh, just using your body, I decided to try to so do something wireless. Now it worked last night and I'm hoping it works today. I have a Wii remote. Now, there's, some, there's a utility called GlovePi. It's a free utility that you can use. It's a version 4.3, and it works on Bluetooth. Is that Decatur? Yeah, this is the city of Decatur. Okay, let me see if I can do this. It's okay, I'm over here, right? How good it works. <laughs> okay, this is the city of Decatur. This is paired up with Bluetooth for your laptop so you could try this on your own. This also gives you a little more freedom if you're presenting and you want to walk around. What you do is we have this interface here. And we can drag this around wirelessly. And let's see, I'm going to go ahead and uh, zoom in. Is this all HTML5? Yes, HTML5.net. So it's, it's just HTML5.net uh, framework 4.0. I write the code in the background for the finding of the address in uh, .net. So we're going to go ahead and what's going to happen is this 111 Main Street, dang, if I could be transparent, it just work well. We, uh, the uh, sex offender comes in and says, I want to, live to, want to move to 111 Main Street. So the first thing we're going to do is say, okay, let's see if you can live that address. What it's going to do, it's going to look for that address, and then it's going to say, okay, how many addresses are there actually? So it zooms in to the addresses it has. As you can see, there's two of them. And let's see, let's go ahead and skinny this up just for a second. There, 111 East Main and 111 North Main. And since we have two, we'll say, okay, this person wants to move to 111 East Main. And the next thing it's going to do, it drew a polygon around what's called a parcel, and then it buffered by 500 feet. Now, since this is in JavaScript, there's kind of a security. If, it could probably do this in an XML HTTP request to get the data, but it doesn't return the data except on our server locally. So normally you would see that this is actually not a safe zone because if we zoom in over here, If you look right there, you see that building's highlighted. This a little bit, it's uh, more apparent on our GIS applications back at work, but uh, that tells you this is not a safe zone, so they couldn't live there. Now, another nice thing, if they don't trust this application, is telling them the right distance. The nice thing we do, we can go to the tools, pull up the measurement tools, 
and we can just say, okay, let's go down here and go outside the parcel. And it's what I like to call close enough for government work. But this is 474 feet. Go ahead. Well, it's just to double check, you know, the data okay. to make sure the buffer is right. It just, just, it's just to tell them, say, hey, if you want to double check it, go ahead if you, if you don't think it's true. Yeah, the only people that actually see this are the people in the police department. The sex offenders don't actually get to see this application. Oh, they don't. No. This is just uh, for their own benefit. If they just, if they're paranoid and they just want to double check to see if the data actually got measured out correctly. A uh, question for you, Chris. Uh, yes. I gathered from uh, what you've described so far, it sounds like, so uh, these particular individuals can't live like maybe near schools or certain areas, they have to have a distance, is that what you Yeah, they can't them? live near schools, uh, playground equipment, not parks, playground equipment 500 feet from them. So, so how do, when, when you have this sophisticated software that del delineates up to, you know, this many exact feet, it's clear for a police department, but then I guess these these other folks, how do they know where they live? Well, they, they sex offender, registered sex offender is required to come into the police department and ask oh, okay. if they can live at an address, and this is what we use to find out if they can. Okay, thank you. Somewhat related, this is really not a programming question, this is just a pragmatic practical question. Why couldn't you just publish a static paper map that highlights all the places they can live and just give it to them. Because the city of Decatur is too big. Oh, it's too big to put on a map? They have globes, you know. Well, they it's, have entire, the entire world on a map. There's a lot of houses in Decatur. It's not that easy to put every single house in the city of Decatur on a gigantic map. No, but I mean, <clears throat> like, if, if you can't live within 500 feet of a school or playground equipment or whatever, you know, where children gather, whatever the, the law says, can't you just block out all those places that would be ineligible? All well, there are homes? also private daycares which are unadvertised. That's the data that's fake on here. Oh, yeah, that okay. cannot be advertised and we can't publish those maps. Ah. That's internal use only. I would imagine this would be right. updated pretty regularly. Yes. It would be kind of... Possibly I guess the kids that go to those daycares have to know, though, right, where they are. <laughs> the kids know. And their parents, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, just, yeah, just a practical matter, that's all. Another thing we can do, if somebody wants to know what type of location that happens to be, we can go ahead and identify a location. And this tells us this is a public location called Teen Challenge Indicator. This is a real location. Question? Yeah. Um, how is the, um, the radius calculated? I mean, it's not really like programming, more of an interest one. How, how, well, I guess it is programming. How are you calculating the, the radius there, the 500 foot radius from that, that shape? Are you recalculating based on each edge or from a central point or how is that? How's well, that this being? is the radius of the polygon. Yeah. And it's based on a geometry service. Right, but let's say, say um, in the, uh, the building there, the, uh, the lower left corner, it's, a, it, it's, it's, a, it's an awkward shape. So is, the, is the, uh, then the 500 feet being recalculated? This parcel right here? No, the, uh, to, the, uh, left, to the left and up slightly. No, no I'm telling you, this, oh. this polygon right here? Yes. All directions coming from it are 500 feet. Okay. In all directions. That's why that, I would assume that's uh, from the edge of the I, I would assume that's why yeah, the edge of the property is a, a it's perfect it's circle is because it's, it's going not off an of property boundary point. lines. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, 
question while I have the mic. Um, the, uh, the information about the particular areas, if you were to click on and try and identify an area which wasn't in your private database, is it possible to pull that information from other sources? I mean, like Google Maps, we can click on a restaurant and find out information from there. Have you integrated that type of information into here? I have on another map. There is another mapping application I created. It is for finding, finding an address to see if somebody that wants to work in the city of Decatur lives within a certain distance. And we use our own web services, which are published by us that has our own data, but we only go as far as Macon County. So there might be like firefighters who live outside of the city limits of Decatur and outside of Macon County. And we have to see if they're within the required distance. And if they are not, we use something, we use Esri's web service. That's the company that makes the uh, API we use for this application. And we put the two web services together, and then we calculate the data to see, and we uh, do a, uh, don't you hate that when your search engine in your own mind doesn't work? <laughs> Yeah, there's a pop-up blocker. <laughs> it is uh, intersection is what I'm looking for. We see if it intersects, and then uh, we look up the address, and it crosses over our own data to their data, and then we measure the property, and it buffers the same way. We like say eight miles; can, they can live within eight miles, 15 miles, or whatever, and evaluates that. And that's two different web services, and it's possible to do it with Google Maps and Bing Maps as well. You can integrate our data and their data and Esri's data using web services. Now this thing right here is why I'm using Google. This is one of the reasons why I'm tempted to try to learn MVC because this is kind of funky. This is a .NET where I cleared the results just now and the clear results button just disappeared. Internet Explorer for some reason does not work. It works in all the other browsers I've tested <laughs> except Internet Explorer. Yeah. Eight and nine. Uh, one of the other things, if you uh, decide you want to download this and ask me questions, it's right in the web application, my contact information. This is just a little no another dojo widget. Right, you can move the map around independent of this box here, and you can move this box independent of the map. And you can go online and steal my code. I, I don't mind. I encourage it. Anybody want to try the Wii? We did, a, we did another presentation where uh, we brought up the on-screen keyboard, which I'm not sure how to do that offhand. If anybody knows the special keys? By using the on-screen keyboard, we were using the Wii literally for both keyboard and movement of the map on here. Yeah. So, uh, so is, it, is it Bluetooth? Yeah. Just, uh, just pull the trigger like the B, B control. And then how do you, how do you zoom? You, uh, oh, let's see here. You go, um, I'm holding the B down button down, the trigger button. Okay. And if you want to zoom on the map, you go with the zoom button. And then you press, press the A and see when it, white, it turns white. You know it's ready to zoom. And then you can come over here on the map and you pull both triggers at the same time. Okay. <laughs> that, that's really awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yep. And we'll go back to the full extent. Okay, once we have this mapping application all set and ready to run, there's another thing that, even though I don't use the Yahoo user interface API that much, I do use something called UI, 
which is a compressor for the uh, for CSS and JavaScript. Put the uh, example of how to do it in this code here. Wrote it in PowerShell 2, where you can use uh, UE to convert this using UE and Java. Will uh, compress your JavaScript and your cascading style sheets. When you look over here, your your star, your asterisk, and your asterisk CSS and JS. That's taking care of all of your JavaScript and cascading style sheets. So if you have several of them, real quick route. If that's not fast enough for you, yeah, what a name, huh? <laughs> Squish it. This is another tool, and I kind of got forced to do use this in C Sharp, which this will take all your CSS files and your JavaScript files and turn them into one file, minified, which will reduce it about by 50% again. So making your site even faster with that. These, uh, these links here that you see, and this will be available, right? Yeah, with these links, you can go to the tutorials to see how to use them, and you can apply them to your own websites. Now, here's a bunch of other free tools I like to use, some of my favorites. Notepad++, it's kind of my cheat sheet for HTML. If you're a web designer, you probably already know about this free tool. To anger you. <laughs> or bad choice, you pick. <laughs> but if you can't read this, uh, I, another piece of advice is go by the icon logo and then just uh, scan it in and kind of check out the different locations. We have a uh, fiddler over here, another nice utility for debugging your sites. This I use GitHub to as a backup for all my web applications because I've lost my own sites at my work and even my hard drive too many times where I decided I'm just going to save my stuff at a virtual location as a backup. Use GIMP for some of my graphics on my website. Some police applications where I've created icons, I've used a free software tool called Inkscape where I created SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, which is another kind of cool thing in XML. Whenever I have questions, I also use Cam Studio, which is an open source free software. Instead of asking my questions, you ever go to those things and people say, well, can you give me more details, upload code, and then say, I think I understand what you're saying. I find when I record my questions and show people what I'm talking about uh, by a screen recording, majority of the time they already know what I'm talking about and immediately answer my question in one shot. So I've been using Cam Studio a lot. Greenshot is like your print screen on Windows. It's really nice. You can just take a screen, you can take a portion of your screen anytime and just it pops it up there like it goes into paint, like just like that. Real nice little utility. What's the third one? GitHub. Oh. Yeah. The application I created is in uh, Esri. This is the forums where you can get help if you want to try building these applications. Another thing I do is I publish the uh, videos to YouTube and then I create a link going to the videos. Instead of writing my question, if you ever see my questions, you'll sometimes see a link and it goes right to YouTube because that's where I publish my videos of my questions. Dropbox, that's my nice way of sharing with others my code sometimes. It's a real, real nice utility. It's more and more people are doing that. Twitter, if you want to contact me or not. But uh, it's, a, it's one of the easiest ways to get connected to me if you have questions on the fly or something because I kind of have it on 24-7 on my phone and everything. And if you like the QR codes and you'd like to create QR codes that you can scan into your phone also, I create a QR code for QR codes. <laughs> hey, if you need to contact me, this is probably my best one to get in touch with me at cruncher06 at gmail.com. I work for the city of Decatur. If you'd like to download this application and kind of tinker with it, it'll work right on your uh, machine immediately. There's nothing you have to configure. You just open it up and it runs, just as long as you have .NET installed. Uh, .NET 4.0, I should say. But, uh, and all the references to the JavaScript APIs that are required is uh, already, it's, it's on the web. 
but you can look at me, look me up on github.com at csargent45, and it's called SOA Final because I have a few uh, repositories. Okay, anybody else want to? I, I actually have a question. You, you yeah. mentioned the videos, and they, they work well for answering questions. How do you deal with training on your application? Because um, a lot of us are, are app developers, and sometimes we're not even the ones training, but sometimes we wish we were. Um, how do you deal with training the folks behind the counter who are answering the sex offenders on how to use this? Do you use training videos for those as well? Or Yeah, I, I created a video for the staff that use the sex offenders application. I ran through the video, and I used the application, and then I showed them manually, saying this is how you look this up. You know, zoom in, find the address, and what this tells you. Is that what you Yeah, so do you find that the videos cut down on you having to do retraining when they bring in new staff and things like that? Yeah, well, haven't had to worry about that yet, but one thing it has eliminated the need for, writing up long, drawn-out instructions. That nobody will probably read anyway. Right, because most of the time when you write instructions, people call you and ask you how to use what you, because <laughs> they haven't read the instructions yet, because... Nine times out of ten, even with, with help, I'll ask people, you know, did you read help? And, you know, they don't want to admit to it. First thing they do is they get really frustrated because you asked them if they looked it up on help because they don't want to admit to that. But the, the videos I've found is that people find those helpful. I've gotten compliments on forums by saying, this is my record, this is my question. Because I say, I tried to drag this over here and then I... Uh, zoomed in on here and then it crashed. This is what's happening. And they see it crashing and then I go through pieces of my code and say this is what's happening in my code. This is what I expect to happen. And I don't have to put a whole block of code online and then they have to read through all of that. They can see my application crashing and see when it crashes, how it crashes, and where I'm expecting things to happen in my code through the video. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, Chris, when you were scrolling through your uh, code there, your HTML, yeah, <clears throat> the, the first thing that struck me was, well, you pointed out that it was an HTML5 application. And HTML5 is part of the title of your talk. Right. Can you show us what, you, what HTML5 features you're using? I don't see any. Uh, but maybe I'm just missing them. Oh, they're like, just... Like, for example, I mean, I don't s see that you're using any of the s semantic tags they're, like aside or... Aside's right there. Okay. It, it, they're just some of the basic HTML5 tags, not some of the fancier ones. Uh, I have the aside. We also have the... Uh, I kind of like the side tag because they call it a sidebar and that floating panel is what my aside, that, that floating panel you saw moving around, that was the side tag, that was a sidebar and I call it a sidebar and I thought, well, that's kind of nice. Let's see if I get down here. Section ID, also a HTML5 element. Right. This is where the map is located. Are you using any of the HTML5 APIs or anything else? Uh, just the basic HTML5 tags for the most part, some of the... Or what yeah. benefit does, do those tags provide over using HTML4 or XHTML? I, I'm just wondering... Well, I group things based on, like, I put the footer down here because there's, there's no footer in HTML4. I mean, it's, right. for me, it's helpful to group things in certain locations, I, I put the, the section tag for my map and that's one block tab for my map and then I put my footer title in, within the footer. Mm -hmm. And the sidebar helps me, you know, put that in a certain section. It really, more than anything, it helps me with grouping of all my elements. And that's the main thing I've used for the uh, most common uh, HTML5 tags. Right. Yeah, one other question. Um, I noticed that you're loading two different 
uh, JavaScript frameworks, I think Dojo and Rico, right? Yeah, Rico. Or is it just, is it just those two? Yeah. Yeah. Um, why two? Well, I couldn't figure out how to do rounded corners in Dojo. Oh. So Rico style, sh and Rico, even though there's not really any work being done on it too much right now, it's, there it kind of is, but uh, Rico allowed me to make rounded corners when you saw that sidebar, that floating mm -hmm. at the tops and the bottoms that had rounded corners on it. And simply put, I was asked to create rounded corners on the <laughs> sidebar. <laughs> so I why, did. Why, why Dojo rather than jQuery? Just curious. Dojo was what I first started using. I, in the future, I plan on migrating some things to jQuery, but for right now, it's easier to continue working with you know, kind of what you know and then migrate slowly over as well. Makes sense. Hey, uh, Chris, two questions for you. Um, uh, one of them's on uh, the Google mapping software. Do you, do you know what the implementation details are for that? Are they using Canvas for the Zoom? That's the first question. Uh, basically, what you know about Google's implementation. Uh, second question is more business process. So if a sex offender moves to a location and then a private daycare opens up within 500 feet, uh, do they relocate? Wow, this is easy. I don't know one either. <laughs> it, it's a, I'm not really sure how the law works on the sex of, how sex offenders, you know, you know, when a, when a daycare opens up, I mean, we had a daycare open up uh, close to my house that I saw them advertising outside, and I know we have sex offenders in our neighborhood, and I'm doubting you can move an existing sex offender once they were already established. That's just a guess, but you'd have to refer to whatever the law might be, and I'd have to refer to the City of Decatur Police Department on that one. <laughs> they would be able to answer the question, though. But uh, as far as Google Maps has kind of been more of a tinkering with it. But another thing, though, with HTML5 is when I created the first tag up here, HTML language, this is you know, opening with HTML language, HTML5. But one thing you need to watch out for is this, where I put meta character set UTF-8. Very important you put that right there if you're going to write HTML5. Uh, there's a certain length limit that you got to watch out for in HTML5, and this just basically makes it so you can see. It doesn't guarantee people will see this site in English, but this is basically telling you, say, hey, we want it to display on somebody's computer in UTF-8 code. So. Not all the fancy stuff where you have video and everything like HTML5, but if you go through this, you'll get some of your foundational HTML5, and you also see some references in some prior uploads in GitHub on the cascading style sheets that references some of these HTML5 layers that may not normally work in, in browsers. I've got it in some compatibility when, we, when I've styled the application. Uh, question. I don't know if you have to deal with this there, but I work for the state, and so accessibility is key. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking at HTML5 is because the increased accessibility uh, tagging options in it, and you know, with the screen readers especially. Now, your application is very visual, and so I'm wondering, you know, do you have to deal with the accessibility limitations? And if so, how do you with a, a mapping type solution? Well. We, we don't, but I used to work at the Illinois Department of Human Services, so I know exactly what you're talking about, that Section 508 just rolls off my tongue <laughs> yeah. because they redid the website when I was there so many times that I think they're probably still redoing it because you got to have people that can use screen readers. You got to have, you know, test through JAWS and stuff like that, and, and we don't have to, but my objective when I create these is, you know, make it the... Uh, most user friendly for tabable interface, so you can tab through the interface, stuff like that. And 
but as I continue with my applications and I encourage, that's why I encourage sharing and that's why I say I'm on GitHub, you know, go over there and see my application. Right down to that is, is an important thing for any web development. Anybody should you be able to use your web application. And one of the things he's talking about the state though, technically what we should have and, and since this is an internal application and, and certain staff use it for a specific reason, but I brought up the external sites that said, you know, we need to have an alternative for our web apps because in a mapping application, if you're at, at the state, which technically I think it's all government, but I think we get a little lead way. There's, there's kind of one of those also rules that as long as it doesn't cause a undue duress or something like that for, you know, you, you've got some lead way there. But the alternative is to offer text for the information, like if we were looking up the sex offender stuff, if somebody that was disabled or that could not see visually, we should be able to return this data to somebody that's visually impaired and say, this is not within yeah. the, the limits, and that would yeah, that would I, take care of that. I know one of our, our criteria is that you have to be able to use it in a functional method without JavaScript enabled at all. So it gets rid of your jQuery, it gets rid of anything client side at all, and you still have to be able to use it in a traditional sense. And that can be very difficult, especially when you get to this level of uh, application, so. Yeah, that'd be tough in mapping. Yeah. <laughs> Impossible. Uh, all, all three APIs that this, this company has, net result, Flex, Silverlight, and JavaScript. Flex and, Java, Flex and Silverlight are basically client plugins, so in the end, you're dealing with client three times in a row. Yeah. So it, it, I, maybe they're okay with Silverlight and uh, Flex maybe because you can do a lot of that standardization, but you still need a plugin tool. Hey Chris, uh, another question for you about the business process. It's just, it's fascinating. Um, do you guys ever get a list of um, sex offenders and then use your software that you've written to correlate that with, you know, where schools are and then come up with a list of non-compliant individuals? No, we don't. Well, I don't. But is, it looks like what you've developed could do that. I guess I, I don't know. Well, there's a, there's a desktop application that's called ArcMap. And if, if you, that's not a free tool, that's $1,000. But uh, it's, it has the data and technically they could, they could look up the information, but it would take a while to evaluate. You, know, you could do, run a query, there's a query builder, and you could probably you could go ahead and run it against the four layers of data, which is we have these individual layers that says the data is uh, daycare, private daycare, and, uh, school ground, play, playground equipment in schools they could run it against all those different layers and they could return the data if they wanted to and they might. But they, they have, a, they, have a, they do crime analysis over at the police department which that's not what I do for them is just to return a automated processes that they ask me so they can get things quick. Just to kind of add to that, I know that because I've, I've done a little bit of GIS stuff as well with my job, and I know that once you have the Latin along, down to like the fifth decimal place of a location, you can actually use SQL queries um, with uh, radius functions against other data sets of Latin longs to be able to do your joins and, and your intersections and things like that to be able to find out those types of things. It's all, the, the key is getting the Latin long for all of your locations because uh, one of the things that we're struggling with is like Google Maps limits you, I think, to 100 data points for the free on the fly um, uh, GIS uh, encoding. So, you know, if you want to do beyond that number, every single time someone loads the page, you have to pay for those types of things. So, I, and there are a couple of different services out there. Uh, which is why you'll find a lot of mapping applications actually store, as, as people are putting in their, their address information, they're storing the Latin long so that they don't have to go and recalculate it because that's something that's never going to change. Yeah, the storage of our data is, once again, you can use the web services free of charge, but when you actually start using the data that you store, that's when the price goes up. Uh, the, well, we use something called ArcGIS Server by the same company, and that goes up to 10000 
so automatically so it's and then the more you want to do of course the price continues to go up so thousand dollar desktop app to get to ten thousand dollar data and then <laughs> run your simple query Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yep.